Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. This webinar on US federal benefits is presented by the American Citizen Service Units in Amsterdam, Brussels, and Luxembourg, and the Federal Benefits Units in London and Dublin. This webinar will be recorded and posted on our Facebook page for future viewing. Please let your friends and family know that this information will be accessible even if they are unable to attend today. There will be a question and answer session at the end of the presentation, but it will be limited to questions that were submitted in advance. Unfortunately, we received too many questions to answer all of them during this webinar. If you have a question that is not addressed during this presentation or during the question and answer session, please visit our website for additional information on our services. Unfortunately, we are unable to respond to any questions posted on YouTube or Facebook, so please do not post questions there. Contact information will be provided at the end of the presentation. Okay, let's get started. Today, we will be providing an overview of the federal benefit services that American Citizen Services units provide to US citizens living in the Benelux region. After the ACS presentation, our colleague from the Social Security Administration will provide an overview of services they provide as well. Finally, during the Q&A session, we will respond to some of the questions that we received in advance of this event. Our goal is to provide you with an update on what services are currently available, how to contact the appropriate office that provides the service you need, and to address more complex issues that are related to federal benefits and how they impact U.S. citizens residing overseas. I'd like to take a moment to briefly talk about the Department of State, who we are domestic and abroad. We are around the clock and around the world. 260 embassies and consulates worldwide, and 26 U.S. passport agencies in the U.S. We help U.S. citizens make millions of trips abroad every year. There are approximately 9 million U.S. citizens reside overseas, and more than 325,000 students study abroad each year. This slide includes a list of all the services we provide to U.S. citizens abroad. The services in the left column are for more urgent circumstances. The services listed in the right column are routine services. As you can see, emergency services to U.S. citizens are the priority. The pandemic has made providing the full range of services challenging due to the limited staffing and space to provide passport, consular reports of birth abroad, and notarial services. Federal benefits fall behind emergency services and passport and citizenship services. We will continue to do our best to provide federal benefits when staffing and our workload allows. This slide also lists the services we provide in order of priority. We do our best to provide the full range of services, but depending on the local situation, not all posts are able to provide all services. The global pandemic related closures, space limitations, social distancing, and other COVID-19 mitigation efforts have created significant backlogs and wait times for appointments for certain services will remain longer than usual for the foreseeable future. Another factor to note is that all three concert sections in the Benelux region are small and have limited staffing. Now that we've covered the broad range of services that ACS units provide, let's go over the various federal benefits and programs available to US citizens. ACS units generally do not provide any of these services directly with the exception of certain social security services, but we are happy to help direct US citizens get the appropriate agency to assist them with their request. IRS, unfortunately, ACS units cannot provide IRS services, assist with tax issues or cash treasury checks. However, we do maintain contact information for the IRS and other tax related information on our website and encourage US citizens to review this information and contact the IRS or Department of Treasury directly with any questions. The IRS or National Taxpayer Service Call Center is operational Monday through Friday from 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And that contact information is available on our website. When it comes to selective service, Almost all male U.S. citizens and male alien residents living in the United States who are age 18 through 25 are required to register with Selective Service. Dual nationals of the U.S. and another country are required to register, regardless of where they live, because they are U.S. nationals. For information on Selective Service, how to register, and contact information, visit www.sss.gov. Veterans Affairs Services. 
Service members, veterans, and their beneficiaries can apply for benefit services on the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs website at www.va.gov. The Federal Benefits Unit in Dublin can also be of assistance if veterans and beneficiaries have questions about benefits and services. ACS units, however, do not provide any services on behalf of Veterans Affairs. Voting. Overseas voting programs are managed by ACS, and we maintain information about voting on our website. We also accept voting ballots from U.S. citizens and forward them to local election officials in the U.S. on your behalf. For information about election dates and deadlines, subscribe to the Federal Voting Assistance Program voting alerts. FVAP also shares voting alerts via Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Learn more about the Federal Voting Assistance Program at FVAP's website, fvap.gov. Lastly, ACS units provide limited social security services if resources allow. Please visit the website of the ACS unit nearest you to obtain information about the scheduling of appointments for social security services, including filing new application or obtaining a replacement social security card. Our colleague from the Social Security Administration will provide more information on social security services available through our federal benefits unit in Dublin. One issue that continues to be raised by U.S. citizens overseas is the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act. The Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act, better known as FACA, has created challenges for U.S. citizens that have foreign bank accounts. We are aware that many banks have been closing accounts to avoid the fines associated with lack of compliance with FACA. Here are a few points that we hope will help you understand FACA. To be compliant with FACA, U.S. citizens are required to provide a social security number to their financial institutions. Many U.S. citizens have been living abroad for many years and may not have a social security number or have immediate access to the number. Banks in many countries have taken steps to reduce their risk of U.S. Treasury fines by closing accounts or denying new accounts to U.S. citizens that are unable to provide a social security number. Unfortunately, the ACS units are not authorized to discuss or provide any advice about FACA compliance. All inquiries must be forwarded to the Department of Treasury. We do recommend that you consult with a financial consultant or tax advisor if you are concerned about compliance with FACA or any other related tax related issues. However, ACS can assist by accepting your SSN application or if necessary, provide you with information about renunciation of US citizenship. Although renouncing U.S. citizenship can possibly make it easier for your bank to maintain your account, expatriation or relinquishing U.S. citizenship may have potential tax consequences. We strongly recommend that U.S. citizens concerned about FACA review the joint frequently asked questions from the Department of Treasury, Department of State, Internal Revenue Service, and Social Security Administration on obtaining Social Security numbers, expatriation, and tax implications. These frequently asked questions are available on travel.state.gov and our embassy and consulate websites. U.S. citizens that choose to renounce their citizenship are issued a certificate of loss of nationality. While renouncing citizenship may sound like an easy process, it is not. We take it very seriously and the act is irrevocable and expensive. Additionally, renunciation may not provide exemption from U.S. income taxation. If the Department of Homeland Security determines that the individual renounced for the purpose of avoiding taxation by the United States, the Immigration and Nationality Act provides that that individual will not be admitted to the United States. The renunciation process is time consuming and is not as high priority as providing emergency services, passports, or consular reports of birth abroad to U.S. citizens. Given limited staffing and waiting room space in our facilities at certain posts, wait times for these services may be very lengthy. We encourage U.S. citizens to ensure they have provided their social security number to their institution and continue to follow IRS guidance. In Amsterdam, for example, the demand for renunciation services is very high. The ACS team worked very hard to reduce CLN processing backlogs that built up while other routine ACS services were suspended in 2020 due to COVID-19. Although over 200 U.S. citizens were able to obtain their certificates of loss of nationality over the past six months due to a recent increase in demand for the priority ACS services, CLN processing is currently suspended and processing times may be high as six to 12 months. 
Luxembourg and Brussels are also unable to process CLNs at this time. We regret that we are limited in the service we can provide, and we will do our best to resume all services as soon as we are able to do so safely. I hope the information on the role of ACS units with regard to federal benefits is helpful. The ACS units in Amsterdam, Belgium, and Luxembourg are here to assist you. If a U.S. citizen needs a service that we do not provide, we would be happy to direct you to the appropriate agency or entity that can provide the service. This slide has contact information for all three ACS units in the Benelux region. We recommend that you visit the respective websites of each ACS unit prior to contacting us, as most of the information is available to you via those websites. If you have suggestions on information that might not be clear or have suggestions on improving our website information, please let us know. And now we'd like to invite our colleague from the Social Security Administration to provide information on the Social Security services available from the Federal Benefits Unit in coordination with ACS units in Belgium, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands. Once the Social Security Administration presentation has concluded, we will begin the question and answer session. Uh, thank you, Rosalind. Uh, my name is Jack Luchman. I am the Regional Federal Benefit Officer in London. And along with my colleague, David Lee, who manages our Federal Benefits Unit in Dublin, it's our responsibility to provide assistance on all Social Security matters to residents of Belgium, Netherlands, and, and Luxembourg. Uh, next slide, please. I want to start out by talking a little bit about who gets Social Security um, in the Benelux region. I do this one because it's interesting, but can also tell us a couple of things. You know, first of all, that there's social security benefits out there for you, maybe even if you didn't think that you were eligible for them. But right now there are about 8,900 social security beneficiaries in the three countries. Um, they're receiving a wide range of benefits, but 5,800 of those people receive retirement benefits. Every month we also pay out 100, 100 people disability benefits. Um, nearly 2,800 uh, spouses receive spouses or widows benefits, and 215 children receive children's benefits. The benefit amount can vary. Some people will get as little as $100 a month, or some people get $3,000 a month. But on the whole, the average benefit is $585 per month, and each month we pay the, the region $5.2 million uh, a month in benefits. This is interesting for a couple of reasons. Um, there are 30 million people that live in these three countries and 8,900 people get social security benefits. By comparison, there are twice as many people that live in the United Kingdom, but nearly four times as many people that get social security benefits. And that can be due to a, a lot of different reasons. But it does make me wonder, do we have a large population in the Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg that are perhaps eligible for social security benefits, but haven't haven't taken the opportunity to file for them because they weren't aware of the benefits or maybe they didn't know how to pursue their benefits. Next slide, please. So we're gonna talk about a lot about social security benefits on this slide. And I'm gonna give you more information than you could ever be expected to remember. In 15 minutes, I can't get into a lot of details about all the benefits. If you take two things away from this presentation, I want them to be this. Lots of people can get social security benefits, not just the person who worked in the United States, but a whole host of people that are related to that person. And then the other thing I want you to bear in mind is that if you have any questions about anything social security related, our federal benefits unit staff in Dublin is available to help. We would rather give 100 people a no than miss out on giving one person a yes to get social security benefits. And it's important to know every year we talk to dozens and dozens of people that are in their 70s or 80s or beyond who reach out to us to ask if they're eligible for social security benefits because the question had been lingering for several years. They never really asked about it to find out, well, yes, you were eligible for social security benefits. And if it's something that you had explored earlier, we could have paid you a lot more benefits. So when in doubt, ask the federal benefits unit in Dublin. So let's talk a little bit about what types of benefits are administered by the Social Security Administration. And one of the ways to look at Social Security benefits is not to look at them like a pension or an annuity, look at them like insurance benefits. 
and the social security system seeks to insure you from three major life events. If you retire, social security is an insurance program there to help you. If you die, it serves as a life insurance program for your children, potentially, and your spouses. And that applies to people who die later in life, but also people who die unexpectedly with young children. And it's also a disability insurance program. If you, if you suffer a disability that finds you unable to work, Social Security could potentially be there to pay you benefits. So first, let's talk about retirement benefits. The earliest stage at which you can get retirement benefits is 62. And if you file to get benefits at 62, it's gonna be about 75% of what your benefits could be at your full retirement age. Each of us has a slightly different full retirement age based on when you were born. If you're somebody who was born during the baby boom generation, typically your retirement age is 66. If you're somebody like me who was maybe the children of somebody in that generation, your full retirement age is 67. But as a rule, it's somewhere between 65 and 67 is your full retirement age. If you wanna know what it is, um, you can Google, what is my full retirement age for social security? And there'll be plenty of calculators there that can tell you if you're eligible. Now, at your full retirement age, you will get 100% of the benefits that you are due, but there is an incentive to delay receiving your retirement benefits. For every month after your full retirement age, between then and your 70th birthday, you can earn what are called delayed retirement credits. And that amount, those credits will incrementally increase your check. But it's important to note there's never a financial advantage to waiting until you are over 70 to take your benefits because those delayed retirement credits stop accruing at 70. So if you think you're eligible for Social Security, there's never a good reason not to at least explore it by the time you're 70. Now, if I'm getting retirement benefits, who else is eligible for benefits on my record? And this is something that sets the United States Social Security system apart from a lot of our European uh, partners. If I'm getting Social Security benefits, my receipt of benefits makes a whole host of people eligible for benefits too. The most, commonly, most common benefit, but also frequently missed is my spouse. So if I'm married and I have a spouse and I'm getting Social Security and I have a spouse who is 62 years or older, he or she will also become eligible for benefits when they, when they hit that eligibility requirement. And that's in addition to the benefits that I can receive on my record. It's extra payments. Additionally, um, a divorced spouse can get benefits on my record so long as we were married for 10 years or more. And the nice thing to know about that is that a divorced spouse's benefit isn't going to adversely affect my benefits or the benefits of any spouse I can have, any spouse that I have at the time of my retirement. Additionally, if I have minor children when I'm getting benefits, a child who's 18 or under, a child who's 19, under 19 and still in high school, or a child who has suffered a disability before the age of 22, they can also get Social Security benefits when I file for retirement benefits. So for retirement benefits, there's benefits for me, but there's also benefits for all these people. And probably the most missed benefit that we have for a residence of your country is spouse's benefits. People just don't know about them because there isn't a comparable benefit in the Dutch, uh, Luxembourg, or Belgian system. Now, that's retirement benefits. What happens if I die? And if I die, a whole lot of people become eligible for benefits on my record as well. Let's kind of look at traditional situations where husband and wife are about the same age and their children are about 20 or 30 years younger than them. If I'm, oh, if I'm, at my full retirement age and I die in my 70s or 80s, it's important to note that any widow, widower, surviving spouse, surviving divorce spouse for 10 years is also eligible for benefit, becomes eligible for benefits on my record. Unlike retirement benefits, widow's benefits can start at age 60. Additionally, the same children that we talked about earlier are also eligible for social security survivors benefits. So we've talked about a lot of different people who can get benefits. And I just want to reiterate, you're not gonna remember everything that we're talking about today and there are fine details related to each of these benefits, but just know these are people who can get benefits if I get social security. And if you think that one of them applies to you, I would encourage you to look into it. Disability benefits are a little different. And if you suffer from a disability that stops you from engaging in any substantial job and you've worked and paid into the US social security system, 
the rules and eligibilities for those are so case specific that I don't want to give you an overview of the benefits now. What I would encourage you to do is to contact the federal benefits unit in Dublin and they can kind of help advise you on a case by case basis to let you know if you're potentially eligible for social security disability benefits. Now let's talk about how much work you would have had to had in the United States to be eligible for social security benefits. And this is something that is really quite shocking if you're not familiar with it. In the United States, you need to have earned if you've worked in the United States and you've only worked in the United States to become eligible for social security benefits, you have to accrue what we call 40 credits of coverage. And that essentially means that you would have had to have worked and paid into social security for 10 years. If you work and paid in for five years, you're not gonna necessarily be eligible for benefits on your own record. But here's the thing, the social security administration has a series of agreements with all three countries, Netherlands, Belgium, and the Luxembourg, where if you've worked in the United States and accrued as few as six quarters of coverage, you could be eligible for social security benefits. What that means is at its extreme is if you worked in the United States only for a month, but it came between two different calendar years, or if you worked in the United States during pieces of two calendar years, you could be eligible for social security benefits without it even knowing it. And yes, it's going to be a small benefit, but any work in the United States we paid into Social Security is an indicator that you're likely eligible for benefits. So what I want you to kind of take away from that is, as you're doing your retirement planning, if you worked in the United States at all, you should contact our federal benefits unit in Dublin and see if you are eligible for benefits. The worst we're going to do is tell you no, but there could be a surprising amount of money waiting for you by filing for benefits. And you'll excuse me, we actually have thunder in the background in London, and that never happens here. So if you hear anything, it's the thunder in London, nothing going on around you. Um, let's talk a little bit about Medicare right now. Medicare is very complicated. And one of the things I want to emphasize about Medicare is, while the agreements we have with other countries relate to cash benefits, to be eligible for Medicare at the least expensive avenue possible, you do have to accrue 40 quarters of coverage or your spouse or something like that. But there is that 40 quarter of credit eligibility. Medicare effectively comes in two parts. Part A of Medicare is hospital insurance. And if you've accrued the 40 quarters of coverage or your spouse has, that is something that when the time comes, you do not pay any premiums for. So if you're eligible for Part A of Medicare, you should always sign up for it because there's no downside of signing up for it. Part B is a little bit more complicated. For Part B, you pay a monthly premium that is typically no less than about $150 a month, and you pay that every single month to get Part B. Part B is medical insurance, and Part A and Part B together equal a comprehensive medical insurance program in the United States. Part A pays for hospitalization expenses, Part B really pays for everything else. Now, a lot of the questions we received were, should I take Part B? When should I take Part B? And that is really a unique individual decision that I can't give good information about during a webinar. But once again, if you have questions, you should contact the Federal Benefits Unit in Dublin. Understand this about Part B. When you turn 65, it's possible that you have to make critical decision about Part B that determines your eligibility and the amount of premiums that you pay. If you decide you want to pursue Part B later in life, maybe 70 or even 68, there could be restrictive enrollment periods and there could be premium surcharges that are associated with it. So as you approach your 65th birthday, that's the time when you have to kind of evaluate your retirement plans and do some research to see if you are eligible for Medicare Part B, or not eligible for Medicare Part B, but if Medicare Part B is also in your best interest. One of the questions that we received a, a few, um, one of the topics we received a few questions on related to benefit estimates. How can I find out what I can get in social security and access to other social security information? And can I sign up for a social security account online if I live inside of, uh, outside of the United States and in the Benelux countries? And what I would say is in all likelihood, you can sign up for a social security account online. If you, go to myssa.gov, there's now an option called the id.me process 
where you can attempt to establish your identity online to verify it to potentially set yourself up a my social security account and that's relatively new some of the people on the line i might have spoken to in previous years at previous um, town hall meetings and the answer was no this is a new utility and i would encourage you to look it up and give it a try if you've looked at it and you have some questions that would be the time to reach out to the federal benefits union in dublin to establish an account it's either going to have to be through this online process or through a face-to-face -face interview process with our one of our FBUs in Dublin, London, Paris, Frankfurt, or somewhere else. But the problem is, is right now we're not, we're not able to take these appointments because of restricted access to the embassy. If you want to have an idea of if you're eligible for benefits, what your work history is, you can do this through, on, through paper mail. There's a form, an SSA 7004, where if you complete it, mail it into an address in Pennsylvania, they will mail to you a traditional social security statement that will have that same information available to you. And again, if you have any planning or retirement questions, you're welcome to contact the Federal Benefits Unit in Dublin, and they can kind of give you some general information, answer your questions, and, and kind of give you what you need to start your retirement planning. Um, next slide, please. One of the concerns and topics that we talked about earlier are FATCA and the key role of the Federal Benefits Unit in the Social Security Administration is that we issue social security numbers and we issue social security cards. And some social security number applications can be processed without requiring a face-to-face -face interview, but other social security card application processes require a face-to-face -face interview. And that's an important distinction um, to decide how you're going to kind of navigate the process. Probably the three types of social security card requests we see the most fall into three categories. First time requests for children under the age of 12. So I've had a baby, the baby needs to get a social security number. The rules are gonna be the same for a baby all the way up until the age of 12. The next group of people that we hear frequently from are first time requests for people over the age of 12. I'm 13 years old. I'm 53 years old, I'm 63 years old, I need to get a social security number for the first time. A lot of times those are related to the banking obligations or the person's going to maybe move to the United States for the first time for employment or go to school. And then we also get a lot of requests for people who need replacement social security cards. Maybe they just need to have a new card or maybe their marital status or citizenship status has changed since the last time that they had a card. And each of these things are gonna kind of have different processes and requirements that you, of what you're going to have to do, different things that we'll need to see. So for any social security card question, what I would encourage you to do is email Dublin and say, here's the situation, I need a social security card and kind of give them an overview. I've had a card before, I haven't had a card before, I'm doing it for my child, I'm 50 years old. Tell them the situation and they will provide you with the guidance. If you're over the age of 12 and you've never had a social security card before, you will have to appear for a face-to-face -face interview. But that is something, as we mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, you can coordinate through with the embassy and consulates in Amsterdam, Brussels, and Luxembourg to arrange that interview. But everybody else can do that by mail, by completing a form and sending us some documents. And depending on circumstances, the consulate could help you certify those documents. But in every one of those instances, contact Dublin and we'll kind of give you the guidance you need to go in the right direction. It can be a simple process, but it can be a little hard to tell what steps you need to follow based on your unique circumstances. Next slide, please. How do I contact the Dublin Federal Benefits Unit? Um, and right now, COVID is something where that has kind of uh, affected the way we can interact with customers. But the Dublin Federal Benefits Unit, we are working 40 hours a week, just like we always have. Um, and we have full access to SSA systems. So even though we're working at home sometimes, as I am right now here in London, I have full access to my SSA system. So we are not able to answer the phone calls now. Hopefully this summer, Dublin will be in a position where they can answer phone calls. We will keep information on our website available. But the best way to contact Dublin is either to email them at fbu.dublin at ssa.gov or if you go into the uh, website, which can be accessed through your embassy website, if you choose citizen, uh, services for American citizens and there's a drop down for social security, 
it will send you to the Dublin website and there's this online form where you can submit your question. I'm very proud to report that Dublin is outstanding at responding to their emails. We'll tell you that we ex expect you to have a response within five days, but in almost all instances, you're gonna hear from the Dublin Federal Benefits Unit within a business day or two, and they will help you move in the right direction. Um, so that's everything that we have kind of for our prepared presentation. I'm gonna hand it back to Amsterdam and we're gonna field some questions, both on ACS questions and on federal benefits unit services. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, we will now address some of the questions that you have all submitted and thank you to everybody who did so. Um, we found that there are many people that share the same concerns and for those of you that have submitted questions regarding local tax laws or questions regarding the IRS and taxes in the United States, we unfortunately cannot address those today if they fall outside of the scope of this webinar. Um, on our website, however, you'll find a page dedicated to the IRS, which also addresses the local tax situation and we'll have a slide later on with the contact details there. So given we've received so many questions, let's dive straight in, starting with questions for American Citizen Services. First question we have is, I would like to know how I can cash my economic impact payment or treasury check in the Benelux. If this is not possible, what are the alternatives? So neither the US Consulate General in Amsterdam or the US Embassy in The Hague, Brussels or Luxembourg is able to cash checks on your behalf, nor can we assist you in this process. Um, we're very sad that it's something that we cannot do. Unfortunately, we're just not able to do it. Uh, we recommend that you speak directly with your bank or your financial services provider to see if there are any possible alternatives available to you uh, in the country where you may be located. Many U.S. banks have created apps with the ability to cash checks digitally. It's also possible to cash a stimulus check in numerous stores in the U.S. without a U.S. bank account. Financial service providers and consultants can also provide guidance regarding online virtual banking and check cashing options available to U.S. citizens that are resident overseas. You can visit the Department of Treasury's Internal Revenue Service Economic Impact Payment Information Center FAQ page for additional information and the IRS telephone assistance number for the EIP payments is available um, and we will post that information separately. Right. Um, I was denied an account at a new bank because of my U.S. citizenship. Is the only way to remedy this by giving up my U.S. nationality? No, this is not the only way. You can also provide your bank with your social security number. If you do not yet have a number or don't recall what your number is, contact FBU Dublin for instructions on how to obtain your social security number. Their contact information will be found on our website listed under the US Citizen Services drop-down menu. Third question, I'm an accidental American and my bank is telling me to get a TIN number. Can I do this at the, at the consulate or US Embassy? And what is the process? Yeah, that's a really good question. We get that a lot. Um, an ITIN or the International Taxpayer Identification Number is issued to non-U.S. citizens only. U.S. citizens are issued a social security number. Information for how to apply for a social security number is available from our colleagues at FBU Dublin and Jack already covered uh, that section and how to apply for those services. Depending on your situation, you may need to visit a U.S. consulate, so please follow Dublin's guidance on how to proceed. I have yet to find a good fiscalist that's experienced in both tax systems, USA and other European country of residence. The Europeans are not familiar with IRAs and 401ks, uh, which is a complicating factor. Are there any fiscalists or tech specialists that can be recommended? I don't know if Jack has anything to add to this, but the IRS does have a directory of federal tax return preparers. It's available on their website and we will provide that information as well. No, I think you're right. I mean, unfortunately for all tax related issues, be it tax preparation or stimulus checks, we can't provide any services in London and Dublin either. It's, it's just outside of our um, um, expertise. Thank you. All right. Um, let's go to the questions for federal benefits. Um, first question is, how long before I wish to receive social security payments should I contact the social security office and what are my options as far as what age to receive payments and how to receive payments? 
you know, I think if you have a clear picture of when you want to receive benefits, the time to contact Dublin is three to four months in advance of that date. Um, as we talked about during the presentation, rules are different depending on the types of benefits that you want to receive and kind of what your relationship is to the person that's work. In general, for social security benefits, for retirement benefits, you can't receive them any sooner than your 62nd birthday. And if you're still working, the date you wanna look at is your full retirement age, which is typically somewhere between 66 and 67. But as you approach the point in time where you're doing your retirement plans, remember the wide array of benefits that are out there. You know, you might be eligible for widows or widowers benefits. Try to research as much of that as independently as possible. But in any case you have, if you have any questions about when to file, when to look into it, send FBU Dublin an email with your circumstances and they can provide you detailed guidance. How does US Social Security work for US citizens who have spent most of their time living overseas paying non-US taxes? Is there a way to contribute to the US Social Security system retroactively to make up for low contribution levels? So there's good news and bad news in that question. So the good news is for Social Security benefits, if you're living in Europe in particular, we don't really have a distinction relative to your eligibility about where you live or what your citizenship is. So it's a completely portable benefit for people that live in the countries that we're talking to today. And the distinction between citizenship, um, there may be some tax implications, but your eligibility isn't affected by that. So that's the good news. The bad news is, is that your social security benefit is based exclusively on what you've worked and paid into the US system, either as an employee who's been given a W-2 or as a self-employed person who has filed a Schedule SE. And those are the only ways to contribute to the US social security system. There is no means by which you can voluntarily contribute to the system. Now, back to the good news, if you've worked as little as a year or two in social security, potentially there's going to be some cash benefits for you there. Right. If I pass away before my Dutch husband, does he have a right to survivor benefits? How much social security do I need to have accumulated for him to collect? And is it possible to pay into social security on my own or is it strictly through employment? Do I still qualify for secure social security at retirement even though I'm currently not living stateside? So a couple of those questions we answered with the previous question, but I, I wanna focus in about the question that as it relates to your spouse. And yes, if you die and you're getting social security, your spouse, so long as they're over 60, also becomes eligible for social security. But I wanna roll it back even a little bit further than that, because in the presentation we talked about if you're alive and you have a spouse, your living spouse while you're both alive can also get social security benefits if they're over 62. So when you're thinking about your family member and benefit planning, don't think exclusively of widow's benefits that might be there when you die. There are also life benefits where you can both concurrently get benefits on the record of the person who's been working. I think the next person who asked the question was already aware of that. So they say, my wife is currently 67 and receives social security spousal benefits under my social security number. She will want to apply for her own benefit to be effective when she turns 70. Am I correct in that there is no way to file that application online using my social security? Now that she is receiving benefits, I see no function with my social security that allows an application to be filed for revised benefits. If so, what are the correct email addresses and telephone numbers to reach someone who can prepare that application on her behalf? And how long before her 70th birthday should she contact your office for assistance? So you can still file it online because there's a gateway that allows you file social security applications outside of the MySSA account. But my honest advice for you, the best way to file your application for social security benefits is to contact the federal benefits unit in Dublin. Yes, you can do it online, but in general, it's going to be faster if you do it directly through the Federal Benefits Unit in Dublin. So we want to contact Dublin at the email address that we talked about earlier, and we want to look at it three to four months in advance of the date that we expect to receive those benefits. I'm a US citizen living in the Netherlands, married to a Dutch citizen. I file taxes in the US, but my wife is a non-resident alien, does not. My question is on Social Security death benefits for my spouse. 
spouse as we are doing estate planning. If I read it correctly, there's a death benefit for my social security if I should die. My question is, how should my wife as a non-citizen without a social security number access these benefits? Should we get her an SSN now? How do you validate the marriage so that she gets the benefits coming to her? So what will happen is, and this kind of ties back to a question that we talked about earlier. Yes, the person can get benefits regardless of citizenship status. if They are a resident of one of the countries that we're talking about. And honestly, if they're a resident of most of the countries in Europe. So yes, the benefits will be there for planning, you know, for death benefits when the time comes. But once again, I'd encourage you to look into spouse's benefits because if she's over the age of 62, she can get benefits at the same time, even while you're alive and receiving benefits as well. Now, the issue of the social security number is something that's a little bit different. Typically, a non-citizen is not eligible for a social security number. But if they become eligible for benefits, we will take the application for the social security number in coordination with the benefit application and the two processes will be worked together. In those instances, you may have to visit your embassy or consulate, but you would have detailed instructions about what you need to do to get the social security number. But that would be after you start the application process for the benefits. In the Netherlands, the mandatory retirement age when one starts receiving retirement benefits will be 67, but not in the United States. In the United States, one can file for social security benefits starting at age 62, but if one no longer works, one's social security benefits per month are higher until age 70. If one qualifies for both US and Dutch retirement benefits, can one file for benefits at age 62, but keep working in the Netherlands until age 67? Alternatively, can one receive a Dutch pension at age 67, but wait to file US Social Security benefits until age 70 to receive higher monthly payments? So the general answer to that question is that you're going to pursue your benefits independently of each other with taking the US one and the Dutch one in whatever is in your best interest. So there's no requirement in the US to also get your Dutch benefits. And I don't believe there's a requirement on the Dutch side to take your US benefits, but they'll have to give you some guidance on that. The part of the question though, that I'm gonna kind of say no to is, if you are 62 and still working in the Netherlands, yes, you can file for benefits, but if you're working full time in most instances, you will not become eligible for payment until you reach your full retirement age. So the specific part of that question that talks about working between 62 and full retirement age I would refer you to Dublin for a case specific answer. But the larger question, you will take your benefits as they are in your best interest, independent of each other. Okay. If someone has work history from age 18 to 48 and then retires, how does that affect the estimated benefits given in the My Social Security account? Will the estimated benefits decrease when somebody starts collecting at 62 or 67? So your My Social Security account will list your entire work history, which for this person would be a 30-year work history. And it will compute a benefit based on that 30-year work history of how much we expect your benefits to be. The tools inside of My Social Security let you project out earnings and retirement dates after that, but the estimate can be narrowed in scope to what you've earned. So My Social Security will provide that tool. That will give you a number that's called kind of your primary amount. So what is your full retirement age, your 100% amount? That is the first number that will come out. My social security will say, if you take it at 62, it's this amount. And if you take it at 67, it's this amount. But there are also inside of my social security and elsewhere calculators where if you wanna calculate your benefit for a specific month, you'll take that primary amount, type it into a calculator, and it can give you a month specific answer for what your benefits would be then. And then that would lay, allow you to do a little bit of the strategic planning on when to draw your benefits. My non-US citizen wife has spent five years working in the US and paying US taxes. Will she have a right to any social security payments when she, when she retires? Yes, so I mean, if she's paid for five years, that's definitely going to have her having six quarters of coverage. So she's going to be eligible for benefits. But the thing I would put on top of that, if I'm going to make a little bit of a leap about what's in that question, is if the person who's asking it worked in the US 
for a significant more amount of time and has a significant higher amount of benefit, there's also spouse's benefits to be attached to that. For the wife, if she's getting benefits on her own record, yes to cash, but no to Medicare. And that's something that would also come into the retirement planning. So I've received a number of questions regarding the Mo my social security account and just for completion's sake i'm going to read out one because uh, we've already addressed that in the presentation um but we have a question here that reads a question that comes up when setting up my my social security account um with it you can manage your details like bank information similar to my pay from everything i see it's not available to people overseas you need to provide a u.s telephone number so they can verify your id is there any way for people overseas that they can manage this without having to call? So yeah, I think the encouraging news is this registration process through the ID.me offers a different avenue. Um, I would also encourage you that when you're registering, like let's say that you're doing it in concert with somebody, like if you have family in the States, um, you're welcome to kind of use that phone number and potentially the mailing address in the registration process. It, it's only collected for the sake of registration. So it's not a declaration to the US government that this is where you live and what your, um, what your phone number is. Um, I wouldn't do it to somebody I didn't trust, but if you worked with a family member or if you were visiting in the States, it's something that you can do. But do realize that there's a potential that mail is going to go to that address as part of the registration process. And there's going to be phones or text messages that go to it in that sense. So it'd have to be somewhere that you trust, but try the ID.me process first. It's pretty new and it allows for registration kind of outside of those US addresses. Can social security benefits be paid to an address or a bank account outside of the United States? Are there any limitations on where one can live and receive social security benefits? If a US citizen who qualifies and files for social security benefits lives outside the United States, but still has a US bank account, can or must these benefits be received into the US account? So let's talk about 99% of the people that are asking that question, where they're either living in the Benelux and they're potentially going to be looking at maybe moving in other spots of Europe. Um, your benefits are portable in that sense. Both the spouse's benefits and the primary benefits are portable. Um, they can be paid to whatever bank account you want. So if you wanted to go to a US bank account, it will be paid in the US bank account in dollars. If you're living in the Netherlands and you want it to be paid in euros, it will be paid into a, net, a bank account in the Netherlands, direct deposit in euros at the actual conversion rate of the date of the check. So it can go into whatever account you want and changing it back and forth isn't that big of a deal. So if you want it to go to dollars and then you have it go to dollars, you go, you know, this isn't for me, I want euros. You can always switch it at a later time. There are rule, There are some countries where we don't pay social security benefits. So we don't pay social security benefits for residents of North Korea, for example. There are also some countries where we don't have agreements where spouses can't get paid, but they are not in our, they are not in our region. But like a spouse can't, there are countries in Africa and South America and Asia where non-citizen spouses and widows can't get paid. I'm just saying that for the 1%. For the person who answered this question and most of the audience, all of this stuff is completely portable. I understand we can receive our social security abroad by direct deposit. For European residents, there are now very limiting regulations on keeping cash management accounts with direct deposits in the United States. I therefore would like to know what is needed to make the switch. I obtained an application form via the Irish embassy, which apparently was or is the contact for Benelux residents. But the form looks like a new application for benefits. Um, instead of a form to make an address or deposit change. It also talks about workers and not about retirees that already receive their social security in the United States. So I can't speak specifically to this correspondence, but you will see the term worker and number holder kind of co-mingled on SSA forms because that's essentially the record for which it's paid. So I'm not worried about the worker part. We need to see the fiscal data. And so they probably sent you a one page form in which you have to either self-report the fiscal data or take it to the bank, but that shouldn't be an independent application. Um, if there's a problem with what you have or you have a question about the form you received, I would encourage you to go back to fbu.dublin at ssa.gov and they'll help you sort it out. And if your phone number's on that email and they need to call you to walk you through it, they'll pick up the phone and give you a call. 
Is it possible to pay into Social Security while working abroad in order to earn credits for eligibility? You cannot voluntarily contribute. There are people that work for US businesses overseas that pay into Social Security, or maybe they work at like at one of the military bases, but you can't optionally or voluntarily contribute to US Social Security. I've been told that because I have not paid into Medicare since my 65th birthday, when I now apply for Medicare, I will be fined for each year that I was not paying into the program since that age. Is this true? Uh, well, as we talked about in the presentation, if you're not signed up for Medicare Part B at 65, it is potentially true that you have to wait for enrollment windows and you may have to pay a premium surcharge. But it's also possible that exceptions to that, those enrollment windows and those premium surcharges exist depending on your health insurance and employment situation. So for that question, that's one where you're gonna to need to reach out to Dublin with specific information and there'll have to be a conversation about how to enroll in Medicare Part B. Medicare Part A, no fees, no penalties, nothing like that. You can sign up pretty easily and it's premium free if you have 40 quarters of coverage. I had to take out healthcare here as a resident. Basic insurance is obligatory and supplemental can be chosen. It doesn't make sense to pay the Medicare premium in the US, especially since it ha it's high for some of us and based on the last two years of earning earnings prior to retiring. If we cancel Medicare and should move back into the future to the United States, would it be possible to resubscribe to Medicare? What penalties are in uh, apply in this case, if any? So if you decide to not enroll in Medicare Part B at 65 or at some point in time beyond that, that is entirely up to you. And it's definitely an option worth considering if you don't see returning to the United States in your future, because it's important to note that Medicare benefits only pay for services in the United States. However, if you think it's possible that you might return to the United States in the future or paying Medicare, or if you go to the States a lot and Medicare premiums are maybe less than travel insurance, then you need to be really careful because once you make the decision to withdraw, electing to sign up for it later, could come with premium penalties, but could also come with delayed windows where you could not get the coverage when you wanted it. So for those specific questions, be very careful and consult with Dublin. An American with a career in Belgium does not have Medicare credits, but paid heavily into the Belgian healthcare mutual system. Is all benefit lost if returning to the United States at retirement? I can't talk about the portability of the Belgian health insurance program, so I just don't know if they cover services outside of the United States. On the United States end, if you don't have 40 quarters of coverage, you're going to pay much significantly higher premiums for Medicare Part A. You can sign up for Medicare Part B and your premiums would be the same as everybody else's, but that's going to be very case specific. You'll need to research it on your own and you'll need to talk to the Belgians about if the coverage is portable. One thing to bear in mind is if you're married to somebody who had 40 quarters of coverage and they're approximately the same age, it is possible to get Medicare coverage on a spouse's record. So that would be another variable to consider as you look at returning to the United States. All right, that brings us to our last question. I'm a US citizen that's employed by a Belgian company in Ghent, Belgium. My question is concerning the social security totalization agreement between Belgium and the United States. Since I am employed by a Belgian company and I'm paying into Belgian social security system, is it still necessary for me to return to the United States six months consecutive uh, every five years as stated in the totalization agreement? No, um, I, I'm not entirely familiar with what they're quoting in the totalization agreement, but the process of the totalization agreement makes the benefits portable for both the worker and the spouses of the worker, children of the workers, regardless of their citizenship status. So I think I know what he's asking, but I think that we maybe are misunderstanding our reading of the agreement. But in case I'm completely off in understanding the question, I would encourage you to contact FBU Dublin. All right. Thank you. Um, so I'll now share the slide um, with the information, uh, uh, with where to get the information on the IRS, some more contact details for FBU Dublin that we've shared before. All right.
right? So you find the contact details here for FBU Dublin, for the IRS in the United States, including a phone number. Um, and to conclude the information that we have um, on each of the mission's websites regarding uh, taxes and the IRS. Um, and with that, we would like to conclude. We'd like to thank you for joining this seminar um, and to thank also all our speakers today for their insightful contributions. We hope to have addressed many of your questions and for those that were unable to attend, we will soon put up a recording of this event on our website. There you will also find a list of the links that were mentioned here today. Um, and we wish you a very pleasant rest of the day. Thank you very much.